Guys, welcome to episode 15 of Roll with the Fox, live on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. Today, we're gonna go over- You forgot to say antivirus edition. You can't have my job yet. Hi, guys. So, today, uh, I have an ambitious plan. <laughs> we're gonna try to finish part two of arm locks from top to side and follow-ups. And then uh, we're gonna spend some time um, going over some sort of training philosophies and, and strategies and so forth. All right, so if it's longer than uh, 30 minutes, I'm like a Swiss train to start time. Finish time, not so much. But if it runs a little more than 30 minutes, we'll sort of close out the technical portion of this. So if you're not interested in the training philosophies or or uh, strategies, you can just tune out, and uh, that's it. So let's start where we left off yesterday. So I'm top of cross side. I ferret out and start to go for far side, far side arm lock, all right? So as I start to pivot around, Enrique starts to spin. We, we know that we could stop him fairly deep into that spin. Right? By changing the angle and changing the grip. the grip. The grip is what allows us to change the angle quickly. But when he gets perpendicular to the floor, this is the time to switch, okay? You don't wanna wait, you don't wanna do it before, and you don't wanna do it after. It's not a hard break that when, he, when his body goes perpendicular to the floor. It depends on the person. If you have somebody that's really flexible, you might want to do it a little bit before. If you have somebody that's, uh, you know, very tight, you have a little bit more time. But roughly when their body gets perpendicular, that's the time to switch into a little body. Okay. Guys, noted. Did you notice that? I'm not really pulling him. We talked about that yesterday. I'm pressuring his, I'm misaligning his body. So he really wants to get on his side, but he needs to free his head. But notice how quickly he comes to literally being perpendicular. This is where I start that far side arm. Right? Yeah. Now he's where round one. I'm, I'm going to, I'm stopping with my chest. Okay? I pivot. And I can stop him here. But if he goes another tick, my leg, my right leg gets trapped. So he's holding on to it, he wants to control it. It's not a really strong form of control, but here I could still, I could still get it out. I could get it out. But if I waited that split second longer, now it gets trapped. So, as soon as I see, feel, He's perpendicular. This is where I'm, I'm going into on the fly. Tap. Okay. So, if you want to know how to finish on Pottas, uh, refer to the video Firas and I did. It's both YouTube for free, and then there's some additional elements on his jujiclub.com. Right? Now, let's look at a, a, a very important point. People always ask me, turn this way. Where should the trailing leg, in this case my right, right leg, right foot, where should it be? Should it be here or should it be here? Here or here? Any, any uh, sort of uh, possible answers that you guys are coming up with? Here? It doesn't matter, it's, it's over his arm, over his head, or under the armpit. Do we have any possible answers to this, guys, or possible theories? 
or did, you may know the answer. On YouTube, Jared uh, Maglia says head. Okay, so that is a good answer. But understand that usually when you, when there's... Everybody's saying over the head. Over the head. Yeah. That's a good answer if I'm trying to arm lock it. If I'm dealing with a great escaper, I don't care. And I will explain so, when I have it over the head, it allows me, you guys are correct, it allows my arm lock to be stronger because it allows me to go perpendicular better than, almost by definition, my foot's stuck over there. My angle, it's gonna be hard for me to get perpendicular. Probably the best angle I can cut is, what is it, 60 degrees, 70 degrees? 75. So that's the best angle I can cut. I wanna be, I wanna be, I wanna be 90 degrees for the arm lock. However, there's a benefit when it's under his armpit. As he's coming forward, I'm gonna sit up, pull him in, and shoot my leg through. So, even though my arm lock itself is weaker, it lends itself very well to a follow-up with an inverted triangle. I hit this all the time, and a lot of times, high-level guys that kind of know my game know when I spin to that arm lock, they actually try to take the foot and push it under the armpit. So, as I'm going out, and I'm trying to sit, Enrique, a lot of times, he's he brings it to his to his hip. So now, not necessarily by the armpit. So at this point, I already know what's happening. So as he's spinning out, I'm already pulling him in, shooting my leg through, and I want to make sure I close this up quickly. Guys, I know today was supposed to be a nogi day. Tomorrow we. We tried to alternate gi and no gi, but we figured it's a lot easier to see the tangle of legs, especially on the inverted triangle, if I'm wearing a black gi and he's wearing a white gi. So we stayed with gi one more day. So even though I'm trading less powerful arm lock, I'm gaining the ability to lock him up quickly in an inverted triangle. So you guys are correct that the arm lock is way better if I have my foot over the head. But if he brings it down or if my foot gets stuck under his armpit because his hands are up, no problem, I go with it. As you know, if a lot of you guys know my game, I try not to force anything. I usually try to set up uh, combinations or I try to set up attacks in a way that the opponent has no choice but to give me something literally on a platter. This is one of those things. Do we have any questions on this so far? On Facebook, I'm going to try to say it right. Uh, <laughs> Peter Z Zawadzki says, when you attack with a far, far side arm lock from side control, do you prefer to bite them to give you this omoplata counter than prevent them from doing the hitchhiker escape by controlling the leg? Uh, I'm going to say yes. Uh, can you repeat the question again? I want to make sure I, I, give, I, I give the proper answer. When you attack with far side arm lock from side control, do you prefer to bite them to give you this omoplata counter than prevent them from doing the hitchhiker escape by controlling the leg? Oh, bait them. No, no. I, I'd rather have the arm lock. So, yeah, I understand the question now. So, do, do I try to bait them for the omoplata? No, if I have a choice, I'd rather have the arm lock. The arm lock is very powerful. And it allows me to control him quite well. So um, I'd strongly discourage you from moving around rapidly because yeah. I will shut I things down very quickly. I felt so <laughs> fast. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I will demonstrate because uh, it's a very good question. I don't usually bait people for a follow-up submission. They force me to go into follow-up submission by their defense of the first submission. But my intention is always to finish with the first one. I, I always 
would like to finish the first one. Um, the problem is if you're dealing with somebody that's either highly skilled or has been training with you a long time, and, and, and literally, like with Zenrika, I train literally every day, uh, they know your game. So they know that the first, you know, as soon as you set it up, they already know what's coming and how to defend it. So I have to make sure that I can catch him on a second submission or third. I don't want to chase him for, you know, 18 hours trying, you know, trying to hit him with, you know, 236 submission. I, I literally aim to hit him with the first one. If I can't second, third. Usually, if you can't hit him with the third submission, all you try to do is keep them on the run. But eventually, they will sort of kind of try, try to get to neutral, and then we have to start the process again. But usually. First, second, or third. But sometimes, like, he makes me go to like fourth or fifth. So, this is a very strong submission. Right now, I'm, I'm, I'm using the traditional grip. I'm already switching because if he doesn't tap immediately, I'm already switching because I know how he's going to escape. He's going to be spinning out. I can stop him. I can stop him. I can stop him. If my leg gets strapped, I can actually bring this over and this, I still have. So there's other follow-ups, but your best bet is now my leg got trapped. And if you don't, if you don't cut this angle properly, there's a very fine line between finishing this, I'm finishing right now, to, or, yeah, getting leg dragged. And now I'm on defensive. So I don't bait him into the omoplata, but I will go there. Uh, if he gets, if his, roughly if his body gets perpendicular. But again, the reason why people, skilled people give you omoplata is because it is one of the, probably the single most, uh, single and mo most easy, easiest um, upper body trans um, submission to escape. As Kuros calls it, it's the th least of the three evils. Arm lock triangle and omoplata, omoplata is if, if you're in trouble, that's the one you should give people. It's the easiest one to escape. But that's why I developed a lot of follow-ups on, on Omoplata because I, I, I watch the pattern of escapes and try to nail them at their escapes. Does that answer your question, hopefully? And on Facebook, Adolfo Ferranda says, when do you decide to go for the Omoplata versus the inverted triangle? Uh, inverted triangle, that's, Adolfo, how you doing? Is this, this is episode 15. You, I think you've seen every single one of them. Guys, if you've seen 15 episodes, type it in, uh, 15. If you've seen 15 live, that's even amazing. Adolfo, I think you've seen every single one of them. Excellent question again. Um, usually, if he controls the leg and pushes it down, I will go into inverted triangle. So if it's under his arm, I will go inverted triangle. All right, because the reason for that is so. Let's look at it real quick. So, as he's pushing my leg down, so, yeah, he's. Uh, if I can get it here, I will go for inverted triangle. Go back for a second. If he shoves it, just shoves it. If he doesn't really control it, go. I will go into a plata, or <laughs> tap another arm lock. So it's it's sort of a level of control. If I, you kind of have to read their reaction and see how they're coming out. But if my foot gets stuck under his arm, I kind of make, it's, it's, it's purely practice, it's training. Um, you know, uh, if he controls that foot really well, I may not be, be able to retract it, so I'll, I uh, usually will be able to shoot it through when it comes up. But an excellent question. That one is very, uh, that's a fairly high level sort of uh, uh, judgment call. A lot of 15s and 15 lives. Nice. And on Facebook, Adam Thompson said, what about, the, what about if the guy doesn't hitchhike and he goes in the opposite direction towards his uh, left hip? Okay. <laughs> Enrique does not like your question. <laughs> so 
That is not a possibility. It's a very, very unlikely possibility. Can you pull your arm up? No. All right. So my light positioning is, Mike, can you get underneath? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Do not touch the tree of devices. <laughs> Because now it's, everything is going to be shaky. So I'm going to disengage my legs so you can kind of see where my foot is. So it's very hard for him to pull this arm out, just yank out. Very hard. So the only other possibility is they lock up. And we're going to go over that right now. All right? <laughs> Are you ready for this? Yes. So, so when the guy locks up, straighten out your legs so they can see. Um, so when he locks up, I have time. I know he's made a decision to uh, basically hunker down. Anytime, like if he changes his mind, go oh, change your mind. I can shut him down. You just got to be prepared. But he made a decision to hunker down. So with the gi, I would probably grab my lapel. No gi, you can always go on your leg. But I have time. So this is a, there, it's a very simple process, but you have to follow the steps. Grab his arm and pull. Lean to his head and bring the leg over. This is where I cross my feet. You don't have to. But it, for me, this is good. So you time your legs. So you can see. Okay? This is one of the few times that it's good to cross your legs in arm locking people. Okay? So I cross my legs. I'm going to take this arm out. I don't take this arm out ever. I don't re grip, guys. You don't want to be doing this because anytime you're re gripping, that's a chance for him to just try to rip out. But I'm not. I'm going to keep stay here, but I want you to see something. Pull either elbow out. So it's very difficult for him to pull either elbow out. All right? And now, what I'm, guys, if you got short legs, you cannot cross your ankles. This is fine. But usually people can accomplish that by doing, by pulling the arm in. Bring your legs down. <laughs> so, guys, this is a little bit difficult to do. But the way to do this is I cannot be perpendicular to his arms. Okay? I want to be lined up. All right? So first thing is get my legs in position, both of them. So now I have him trapped. All right? Now, I'm going to line up. So I want to line up with, with the forearm. No, you don't have to give it to me. Don't worry, I'll make it. So I'll line up. My arm starts to drift closer to his wrist. My other arm comes over the elbow, and I connect bolt cutter grip. All right? Now, my left elbow pushes in, my right elbow pulls. So it's, it's, this is the movement. Guys, do not, once, this is the arm you're gonna use. Don't switch. Once this arm is, this is the arm that stays where it is, it just drips down to his elbow. I'm going to bring my other elbow in front of his. Now you guys know why I'm wearing white and black heats. And now I just climb. A lot of times, guys, notice my knees are flared out. Right now I'm concerned about keeping him down. You can bring your legs up again. So if my knees are close, sit up. Yeah, he can sit up. I don't want that. So. Sit up, you cannot sit up, all right? But once that arm starts to fly, my knees come together for a quick and efficient finish. It gets very, very tight very quickly. I'm gonna do it again, guys, but uh, let's see if you have any questions. Yes, good thinking. <laughs> so I'm gonna stay on the same arm. I usually like to do both arms so I can be ambidextrous. I mean, uh, for, for non-English speakers, uh, you know, I want to be as good, 
I, I aim to be as good on both sides, but my game is not symmetrical. But uh, this time I'm staying on the same side so you guys don't get confused. It's just a different view now. All right? So he decides to hunker down. First thing, reinforce his defense. Lean to his head, bring the leg over, cross. Okay? Now, if he's locked up, I don't want to be my body perpendicular to his arms, which it is right now. I want it wide up. Don't worry, man. I'll make it happen. No, <laughs> it's okay. I'm going to bring it in, and I'm going to line up. So now my body's lined up with his arm. I'm going to bring in the other elbow, connect my hands. Guys, you don't want to be doing this. You don't want to be giving yourself cow hands. Palm to palm, ball cutter grip. Very useful grip, guys. We use a lot of it on the Udigatamis and a few other things. All right? Ball cutter grip. I'm pushing forward with my left elbow and pulling with my right forearm, guys. Even very, very strong guys. Now, what happens, a lot of people might even tap here. All right? One more time, we do a little quicker. <laughs> Not quicker, slower. <laughs> I'm taking a shortcut. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, for Enrique's sake, I hope you have no questions on this. On Instagram Acoustic. Uh, Jay Bird asks, does it matter which ankle is on top when you cross your legs? Excellent question. I have found it to really not make a big difference. And Usually, uh, so usually, uh, you guys try to get under this under this, this leg. Go ahead. Because that supposedly that's the leg that matters. But at the end of the day, if you have good arm locks, guys, it doesn't matter. I can literally finish the, yeah. I don't have to be over that head. So even if he pushes the, I, I can always usually get there and if I cannot, try to escape. So yeah, this I can finish. I can switch. So. It's not a big difference. Um, usually you try to protect the, the top leg over the guy's head, but there is a lot of ways, uh, you know, that you can finish people uh, uh, without bringing the second leg over. Uh, if you look at, I forget which episode, when we went over the inverted arm lock, it's so tight I don't have to bring the top leg over his head. Um, there's another, instance where uh, I forget uh, you know when you when I do hit the rolling crucifix you escape and I just slide up there's there's few instances where I don't even bother to bring the top leg over it's I, I, I would but I'm just trying to figure out like how much movement do I have to make uh, but so it's it, long, long explanation it's not a big deal usually people will try to the one that's over the head, but I have found that it doesn't really make that much of a difference. On Facebook, uh, Peter Zawatsky asked, uh, in this particular arm lock variation, what do you think about one arm controlling the arm, the other one controlling the leg, versus the two-on-one grip? Um, I personally uh, focus on the arm, and it's a, it's a very interesting question. Uh, if you look at EBI uh, overtime rules, most people will start with with uh, controlling the leg. Through experimentation, I believe it's better for me to try to 
when, when this happens, because there's some big movements, you may need to switch the angle quickly. So I, for me personally, I found it better to have both hands close to the arm. So in other words, what I'm saying is, I'm giving up some form of control by not having my, my, uh, my hand under his leg, but I'm more than make up for it by quickly being able to, because if, if I have both hands, like joystick grip, right? I can always switch it to the more traditional, pinning it to my chest, but the joystick grip, so this is the grip. Uh, I can, so, you know, if, if he pivots one way, I can push with the right hand towards my left inner thigh, left hand towards the right inner thigh. So let me just go over it real quick. We only have five more minutes. So let me go over the questions so everybody knows, everybody can follow. And again, I'm gonna stay on the same side. So, yeah, Matt, <laughs> wake up. So as I'm doing this, so this is what, I don't have the same level of control because I'm leaning so he can sit up a little bit better. And if you got somebody savvy, like this now starts to unravel for me. Or it doesn't. Yes, it does. Okay. So, I mean, I, you know, we're going real slow, but this is based on, I've played around with this a lot. It's, it's, it's possible to finish, but less likely. All right. So instead, I focus both my hands here. If, stop for a second. If I lean, can you see how much lighter I get on, on, his, on his top? No, I wanna be here. I wanna keep him pinned. Now, if his arm flies, if, if I'm over here, he can, I, I have a hard time controlling the angle because it's one on one. So, now, if I had this, that's a different story. So when we say you need zero to one hands, that's a different story. This, I don't care. But again, if I start to grab it, it allows it to start twist. So I either want this, but in either case, I don't want to go to his leg. Um, and now if I have to switch to the joystick grip, this is better. So I'm giving up some control, but I believe that I more than make up for it this way. <laughs> So that is my philosophy on that. And I've played around with it a lot. Do we have any other questions? Because I want to start to go into, we only have three minutes left, and I want to start to go into um, some other strategy questions so we don't run too late. On YouTube, GM Baseball says, Hi, Fox. Thanks for showing me that us older guys can still be effective rolling with guys young enough to be our kids. Yes. We're going to have our hands strong. <laughs> so guys, we have um, a bunch of questions from Australia, from uh, BJJ uh, Monthly Masters. Um, thank you, Anton, for coordinating this. So we have a bunch of questions. You can sit up, or unless you want to. <laughs> uh, so the technical portion of this is kind of over. I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes, so we're going to run over a little bit talking more about some of the philosophies uh, or strategies, how to deal with certain issues and so forth. So Mike's gonna read the questions and I'm gonna give an answer. So if you're here only for the technical aspects, guys, I'll see you tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. If you're here to listen to this, stay, stay tuned because we're gonna be talking. Uh, these are from Adam Wright, the first three. The first one is, how has your BJJ changed, not only as you've progressed, but as you've gotten older? It's gotten better. Excellent question, Adam. So, it's a very, very good question. Guys, there's only one ask. Yes, you can, you can, you know, lift and, 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 and so forth. It's gonna make you stronger, it's gonna make you better. In some respects. Uh, I don't lift, I only lift guys off. Um, I'll pull them up. <laughs> Or if I'm doing double under, sometimes I can lift some pretty big guys. That's called squatting. But I don't, I don't lift. Um, I focus on honing my technique and efficiency of movement. So as you get older, that's the single one most important thing that I think you can control. 
So as you are, I'm a big believer in visualization and visual learning. And that's why in this current time with the, you know, with the virus sort of ravaging, uh, you know, uh, around, uh, I'm a big fan of, of you guys watching videos. I encourage you to watch videos of people or moves that you're trying to incorporate. You don't have to watch everything. You don't have to watch my whole thing. We label these videos on my personal page, no, but on the Silver Fox Brazilian Jiu Jitsu Academy and on YouTube, they're labeled what techniques are covered. So if you want to go back, refer to those labels so you can pinpoint the part that is most interesting or most relevant to you. One of the questions I think it might be from Adam as well is what is your some specialties? I have a lot of specialties. Uh, I have arm locks, I have omoplatas, I have inverted triangles, inverted reverse straight, uh, guillotines, anacondas. Um, I'm really good at omoplata. But the point that I'm trying to make is, for example, Kimura is not a big move for me. I will use it, but probably out of 100 submissions that I get, Kimura is probably going to account for 5%. But there's guys that it's their bread, bread and butter. So watch, if you want to improve your Kimura, look at those guys. All right? So uh, one of the things that I'm trying to encourage you is, is I, I have a lot of specialties, and I try to in, increase those specialties. And also, I don't want to be, my initial event, maybe 15 years ago, I was like a big guillotine guy. Like, I, I, you know, I, there were literally guys that, you know, I didn't want to train with because six months, this would, this, we'd stand up, they come in, head outside, I give a guillotine him. That would be the whole round. That would be the whole, I'd get up. For six months, we would do the same thing over and over and over. But eventually, people start to, Figure out how you're setting it up. I, I start to beat it. So you have to come up with follow-ups and diversify. I've always had good arm locks, but you know sometimes things go, you know, in cycles too. You know, it's like his head is right here. What am I supposed to do? Like he's not giving me an arm, so I'll, I'll take what you give me. But long story short, um, you want to make sure that you broaden your game. Uh, as you get more, when you a beginner, first year or two, you want to kind of. Uh, take from the basics and understanding different aspects of the game. But eventually, as you start to progress through Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you will start to develop your own game, which is a function of your body style, body type, and personality. And that's when you, you know, changes don't, changes are incremental. You know, don't uh, expect that, you know, oh, here's a uh, Here's a leg lock game, I'm gonna become a leg lock. Yes, you will, if you start to work on that a lot. A lot of drilling, a lot of incorporating. So decide on which aspects of the game are you most interested or most relevant to you and try to absorb those. Hope that answers the question. So I've actually, believe it or not, I've progressed in the last 10 years more than I've progressed in the previous 10 years. Uh, and if, you know, my training, uh, you know, first five years, I was, first seven years, I was training, you know, still mostly stand up, Jiu Jitsu, one, initially one or two times a week, and two or three times a week, and then slowly now, seven days a week. Um, so I've become more and more involved in, in, in grappling aspects versus the stand up. But, uh, I think I am a little smarter about training, and I think that's a very important point that people need to understand that, and also the attitude that you come in with. You, if you come in and, and get tapped 18 times by the same guy, it could be a great day if you try to focus on making one thing better, one or two things better, if you learn one or two things. Um, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is not easy, can be very frustrating, but try to focus on the productive. Uh, what my first, you know, early, especially when I be became blue belt. So I was, and then I hit a really long slump, and it, you know, I would be trying things, and at the time it was kind of like everybody was passing low and tight. Uh, 
clear that that's not my game. And I would just try to do better. Not the guy knew exactly what I was doing, and I just got choked repeatedly. And, and I just get very, very frustrated. And it's like, man, I suck. You know, what am I doing wrong? And how is this happening? It's the wrong way to look at things, guys. You will still progress if you keep training. For, the, for some reason, I get, didn't give up. But you will still progress. But if you take a little bit more sort of productive way to look at things, uh, okay, this didn't work. How can I change it? Who's good at this? Who, can, you know, is somebody doing something different? Can I maybe get a better, better sort of understanding of what he's doing different? My slump lasted literally, guys, 18 months. I do not understand why I did not quit. And then one day I said, screw this. I stood up, Mika passed, I said, Eureka, baby, I'm back. And I just, that, that's, you know, as we talked about in one of the episodes, you know, looser and my, my time passing is good, but my, you know, standing pass is way better. All right? So, again, try to take a more productive approach to your training. So even if you have a rough day, is try to focus on doing one thing better. Just turning the correct way. Okay, this works. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to run with this little bit of good news. Um, this, uh, okay, I know he kicks my ass, but uh, I can sort of, if I start to pivot away, maybe there's some promise. And I learned two moves from that are really going to fit well with my game. That will help you progress faster than if you have sort of a negative outlook on your game. Either way, you will progress. But trust me, this is a better way to look at things. And this last question is, how do you treat or deal with bigger and heavier training partners slash opponents? Excellent question. It comes down to a very simple concept. I move faster than they do. It's harder to execute, but you have to move. If a bigger, stronger guy, he may, and then, you know, it's, it's, to be honest with you, you know, everybody's like, ah, um, you know, this guy is stronger than me. Appreciate that because it will force you to be technical. He will have to, it will have to happen to him as well eventually. But in the early stages, it's, it's a lot harder for the bigger guys because they've been relying on their strength and size. It's a lot harder to make the switch. I have found that big guys, that if they don't make the switch at, by, by the time they get to purple belt, it's going to be a rough, rough go because eventually there's always going to be somebody technically better than they are. And they will get the better of them. They may toss them around for a while, but eventually you know, an opening will be created. So you have to work on your setups and efficiency of movements. But generally speaking, once you slow down, once you let them settle in, it becomes, think of it as, as a quick drying concrete. You know, if you get up and start walking, you'll get out. But if you sort of sit there and try to, yeah, I understand, sometimes you get caught and you don't know what to do. So think about, just try movement. That's why I'm not a fan of, you know, we talked about this, you get on the bottom of the cross side, don't do this. I'd rather try something, escape, get arm lock, tap. Okay, clearly that's not the way to go, or maybe I did not execute properly, but at least I learned something from that, rather than just kind of like, okay, I don't know what to do. Do something, you know, make sure you do it with the right training partners, they're not gonna rip your arm off. But um, I, I believe that especially with faster guys, I will not, I, I just keep going. Until I get an isolation of, of an arm, neck, leg, whatever it is, and then I run with it. You know, uh, and if, if I'm standing, I like if I put, <laughs> I have a really, really good friend and, and I do this to him all the time. He's way, way bigger, way, way bigger. And I, when we stand, I push him into the wall. What do you think he's going to do? <laughs> I know he's going to push back. If his head is on the outside, I'm guillotining him. If, he, if, he, um, if his head is uh, not on the outside, I'm going for an arm lock. Um, I have... Um, one time I, uh, I was teaching a class and there was a, uh, uh, a football coach and the guy was close to 300 pounds. And you know, he was out of shape, but he was strong. And, and I'm teaching and he's like, hey, you wanna go? <laughs> and uh, he, I, I'm stupid. I said, yeah, sure. I push, you hear him. The guy is almost twice my size. Of course, he's not, I'm not gonna push him and he's not going to fall. He pushed back. I arm lock him quickly three times and said, we're done. Unfortunately, the guy never came back. 
And as, as they're leaving his friends, like, what the F is wrong with you? But it just goes to show you, if I push, I know where his response is going to be. He's going to push back. So you just need to make sure that you have an isolation of something that's worthwhile to attack, be it arm, be it neck, or be it uh, the legs. Uh, he had, I think, one more question, Mike. Did I, uh, which belt was more, diff more difficult? Or? No, that's somebody else I'm about okay. to say. What's the, what was the third one? So, uh, Oh, you answered it in the previous question. But Adam Pinniger asked, uh, what's the hardest belt to get through? What was the third question? I didn't answer it. What's your favorite sweep or submission? Oh, guys, favorite sweep or submission. Uh, I usually start with a quick submission attempt, which leads to a sweep. So basically, my favorite sweep is I, I really focus, and you may not be able to do this right away, like kind of feel where the imbalance is and almost make the sweep easy, almost like it's, it's effortless. That's my favorite sweep. So it's not a specific technique, but it's sort of as I attack the, the, the submission and I, they, they, I'm just, I, you feel where their imbalance is and go with it. That's the best kind of sweep. Now as far as submission, guys, I love guillotines and anacondas. I'm very good at them. I love arm locks from everywhere. But guard, the top of cross side, um, from all different angles, up, uh, Udigatami's upside down, with different angles, hybrids, I'm very good at those. Uh, I love knee bars. Uh, I, I hit a lot of knee bars. I hit a lot of reverse and inverted triangles. Um, so I'm very good at those. Uh, so I have a pretty broad repertoire. What I'm gonna try to do is put up, like what the seminar um, uh, that I taught in 20, 19, uh, there's a list of topics that usually the guy that sponsors the seminars chooses from. So it's pretty broad repertoire. But uh, I know when you first start out, it's kind of hard to have a broader re repertoire and you start to uh, hone one specific submission at, at the expense of others because it works, but eventually people will take it away from you. So if you have a good submission, yes, yeah, stay on it, but try to add things. See how they're defending and see what it could be uh, leading to follow-up submissions. So for example, uh, what I mean, so if you have a good triangle and the guy start to, you know, posture up, it's very good lead into an arm bar. And that starts to hone your arm bars. Um, if you have good guillotines, you know, and the guy start to defend it, anacondas, okay? So, I encourage you to sort of, uh, you know, sometimes people, especially when starting out, uh, it becomes overwhelming, uh, you know, all this stuff, and they want to pick, and, and initially you try to pick up everything, and fortunately your teacher will probably teach you a great variety of different things to try to pick up, but as you start to become uh, good at things, you will start to add more things, more incrementally. So you're good at this, if you decide to become good at this, this is gonna be a whole new area. You're gonna to have to spend a lot of time on that, and that's fine if that, if that becomes, a, okay, I think this game is gonna suit, suit me well. Pick it up. But if you sort of focus on this side, start to pick up things that are incremental to them. So how they defend, how can I sweep them off his defense? How can I uh, go into follow-up submission? Uh, so now let's go back to which is the hardest belt? Very good question, blue belt. Blue belt blues. Blue belt is the toughest belt, and here's a variety of reasons. When you get your blue belt, it's a wonderful thing. People are happy. They no longer white belt. But there's a bunch of things that, first of all, usually the, the road from white to blue, whatever it takes, from blue to purple is twice as long. At blue, you understand jiu-jitsu only usually to the point where you start to sort of overthink it and, and it becomes vast and you like get overwhelmed mentally. It's like, how am I gonna learn this? Don't worry about it, it'll come. Stay with the process. The process is more important because sometimes when you think about this massive field, your game is gonna be maybe different from this guy. Don't worry about him. That's, he had that road before you and he might've had the same issues when he was blue belt. When you're a purple belt, usually by then you understand jiu-jitsu. At purple belt, your chances of achieving black belt is probably 50-50. Until then, it, it might be a 
it's, it's, you know, the odds are not necessarily the great, great. The other thing Blue Belt start to think is somehow that the instructors expect them to be the Knight of Blue Belt and uphold all the white belts, you know, in line, and that if he ever taps the white belt, he has somehow fa failed the knighthood. Guys, quite contrary, trust me, you will tap the white belts. Even when you're purple, you will tap the white belt. Sometimes you're training, you're working on something, and the white belt just comes out with something interesting and na nails you with it. Or you maybe, you know, you had a rough day at work, you beat up and the white belt's, you know, gone low and he nails it. It's okay. It's a learning experience. It's a process. Don't worry about the blue belt. I'm not expecting anybody to uphold any sort of level, like, okay, guys, this is it. Do not let anybody through the gates. No, your job when you come to the academy is to learn a couple of things and hopefully have fun with it. Those are the two most important things, guys. If you try to come in with that attitude, it's gonna be a lot more enjoyable, enjoyable journey and it, you will do a lot better with it and you're gonna have a longer term career in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I hope it's a lifelong one, guys. And again, shout out to BJJ Monthly Masters in Australia, guys. Yes, one more question. <laughs> and, uh, I thought I had such a good wrap up. <laughs> <laughs> it was good, it was good. <laughs> uh, the last question is AB Jet. He says, how do you continue training through injuries and, oh, de and yeah. deal with the mental fear of new injuries? Yes, yes. Uh, so, guys, injuries are fairly simple. If you can train without causing that injury pain, you can train. If you're causing pain, you're making it worse, so you cannot train. So if it's your wrist, you can somehow immobile. This is not medical advice, by the way, guys. I'm making disclaimers, all, all this other stuff, follow the advice of your own doctor and all this other good stuff. But if you can immobilize it away and, and it's not getting worse, fine. But if you cannot, you cannot train. Pain is a very simple guy. Where the issue becomes, you know, quite bad is with knees or back, lower back, which to some extent can immobilize. Um, I try, uh, how do I prevent injuries or try to prevent injuries? Um, I try to train seven days a week. I have a weekly regimen in, in my head. I don't, I go off it, like sometimes we get like visitors from another academy that walks into my school and maybe I'm, you know, I train seven days a week. Sundays is usually, you know, could be a hard day, could be a, a soft day, but Mondays usually I'm training at Hendel and usually that's gonna be a hard day. The guy comes in and I wanna train with you. Really? You wanna train, why don't you train with one of my black belts in person? No, no, I wanna train with you, okay? I understand that as you wanna test drive to see my game, so. I may have a hard day. I have, you know, I, I will feel, I will feel how that person's game is. Are they there to just learn and flow roll or, or kind of, you know, play same level of intensity or are they trying to sort of show me what they got? So I, I may have to go off it, but I usually have a weekly schedule in mind. And I cannot, usually my body starts to break down if I have three or four hard days in a row. You, you know, then, then I'm sort of dragging and, and, and you feel it. So, if I take two days off, I'm gonna feel amazing. But then after those two days, I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna be like full of power, full of strength, feel amazing. But now I'm not relying on technique, I'm relying on, on feeling great. So I think a lot of people fall into that, that sort of like, I'm going balls to the wall, I'm gonna go as hard as I can, Crap, I can't move, I'm gonna take three days off and then I'm gonna repeat. So long story short, your tr weekly training regimen is gonna be three days a week, two, two to three days a week max. Then you have somebody else who trains five days a week, they probably feel banged up every single day but train smarter, what do I mean by that? One or two hard days followed by one or two easy days. What I mean by easy days, go to fundamental class, drill, blow roll, I am a big fan of training in the water. Look up Fluid BJJ videos and, and everything. 
Now, if these guys train two get two years with that with that setup, so one guy and that guys, I, your training schedule is also going to be subject to what you do for a living. How big is you know you have family responsibilities, all this. That's your journey. But I'm purely talking about a guy that has time to train four or five days a week, but only can train twice because he he feels great, goes in, falls through the wall, then he can barely walk the next day, takes three days off and does it again. That's example one. The other guy trains four days a week. He goes, you know, semi-hard, then the next day he takes off, then drills, then the next day he trains hard, and then the next day he drills, and then he takes two days off. After two years, on any given day, this guy, the guy that trains, hard, walls to the wall maybe twice a week. On any given day, he can submit this guy in the first couple of years because he's feeling more wonderful. But this guy, the guy that trains four days a week, will have a technically better game. You expand it to five, seven years, even if this guy's the guy that trains balls to the wall for two days a week, this guy that trains four or five days a week is going to have a better game, technically better game. And if this guy, the guy that relies more on power, is going to have a harder time submitting him, even if this guy is feeling like crap that day. So this is a long distance game, you guys. This is a long run game. I love Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I hope people, my students, I, I hope they love it as much as I do. I'm trying to, every time I'm on the mats or if I'm training in the water, I try to do one or two things better and I try to have fun. So I'd strongly encourage you to do the same. Don't look at, you know, uh, if this guy, you know, don't compare yourself to a guy that lives with mom. She does his laundry, she does the cooking for him. He doesn't have a job and basically trains 20 hours a week. That guy's gonna have a faster progression than you do. Question is, will he last? Will he stick, stick with it? Because to some extent, sometimes they don't appreciate the progress. But compare yourself to where you were one year ago, three years ago, five years ago. That is a true measure of progression. Because you're unique, your circumstances are unique, and that is your journey. And I'd encourage you to try to train, come up with a weekly schedule. If you can do it four times a week, your game is gonna be better. If you banged up, don't train hard four days a week, especially when you start out. Maybe two of those days could be hard, two of those days is more drilling. Drilling is underrated, guys. All right, so guys, on that note, I know we went way over. I will see you tomorrow for episode 16, 10.30 a.m. Eastern time.